Well, good evening, everyone, and I, I want to thank all of you for coming to this evening's talk, Dislocating the Orient, the Mikado rewritten for contemporary Montana. Uh, sponsored by MSU's Department of Modern Languages and Literatures, this talk, as Susan mentioned, is being given in conjunction with Bozeman's Intermountain Opera Company's staging of a brand new version of the light opera, The Mikado, by Gilbert, Gilbert and Sullivan, whom you see caricatured in a way that doubtless is offensive to Japan in the cartoon on the screens to either side of the stage. Said to be a satire, on Victorian era British politics set in Japan to avoid censure for its provocations, Gilbert and Sullivan's The Mikado was first performed at London's Savoy Theatre in March of 1885. Even as successive generations of theatre goers have long lost sight of the impetus for the opera's initial targets of satire, the opera's popularity in Britain, the United States, and many other countries has been unprecedented. A staple of amateur performances, it is also regularly revived on the main stages of professional opera companies. The Mikado was the first of Gilbert and Sullivan's operas to be electric electrically recorded in 1926. The 1939 film version, which was directed by Victor Scherzinger, made it the first complete Gilbert and Sullivan opera filmed for the screen. Since then, film and television celebrities have starred in its performances. So for example, Kukla, Fran, and Ollie, if anyone remembers them, sang a rendition of Three Little Maids, one of the opera's songs, on television in the early 1950s. In 1960, Groucho Marx starred as Coco, one of the, one of the uh, characters in the original opera, in an hour-long version broadcast on the Bell Telephone Hour. Over the course of the opera's long history, most productions have used white instead of Asian performers, and they have drawn on assumed inherent qualities of Japanese. Uh, whether positive, which uh, I suppose you could imagine as quaintness or exoticness, uh, negative, which might be envisioned as primitive or untrustworthy, or both, as in indecipherable and foreign. Anyone familiar with Japan can't help but notice that its depictions have routinely conflated aspects of Japanese culture with those of other Asian cultures. Moreover, as scholar Josephine Lee has noted, over the many decades it has been performed, the Mikado has exhibited what Thomas Holt calls racial sedimentation. In other words, rather than challenging popular conceptions of the Japanese as somehow intrinsically exotic, succeeding performances have tended to graft new, equally essentializing images of the Japanese onto their demeaning precursors. Such practices effectively create a repository of representations that, over time, solidify into a hard bedrock of essentialist notions as to what it means to be Japanese. Desiring to stage this perennial crowd pleaser but deeply concerned about its racist overtones, Bozeman's Intermountain Opera has decided to employ the talents of Soren Kisiel of Broad Comedy. I hope I said his name. Is that how you pronounce his name? Okay. Of Broad Comedy to rewrite the libretto of the opera. Um, and there it is. There's, there, there's the ad for it. As its new title suggests, in the Montana Mikado, the staging has moved from a Never Never Land version of Japan to our own very recognizable present-day Bozeman. But in order to convey the necessity for such a change, I think it might be helpful to provide an overview of Gilbert and Sullivan's opera as it's traditionally performed. So I'm, uh, some of you may be already be familiar with this, and if so, you can take a short nap while I do this. Um, and uh, But I, I'll, I'll just sort of I'll try and make this as, as brief as possible. Um, okay. So this is a two-act opera. And um, in um, The Mikado, as written by Gilbert and Sullivan, is set in a timeless Japan in the town of Tikiku, 
which is a place name that isn't even made of Japanese phonemes. There is no way to pronounce Tiripu in Japanese without sounding, uh, you just can't do it given the way that their, their uh, phonetic system works. At any rate, uh, we begin in the courtyard of Koko's palace, and a uh, Nankipu enters and identifies himself with an opening song uh, telling everyone that he is a wandering minstrel. He tells us he's searching for Yum Yum, with whom he is in love. Yum Yum, however, is betrothed to Koko. But Koko has been condemned to death for flirting, which is a capital offense. On condition that he put himself to death, Koko has been promoted from tailor to Lord High Executioner, so that's quite a career move. No one else can be put to death until Koko decapitates himself. Puba then appears, introducing himself as a nobleman of great lineage who has taken on the responsibilities as well as the salaries of all the officials who resigned when Koko was promoted to Lord High Executioner. Eminently corrupt for a bribe, Puba reveals to Nankipu and Yum Yum, uh, to Nankipu that Yum Yum <coughs> is to marry Koko that very afternoon. Koko sings his own praises of his rise to power, sings of a little list he's compiled of all the sorts of people he'll execute, rationalizing, they'll none of them be missed. Koko then consults with Puba in the various administrative capacities Puba has assumed regarding how to get the government to foot the bill for his wedding. Um, at this point, a chorus of schoolgirls arrives, along with Yum Yum and her two sisters, Pity Singh and Peep Bo. Yum Yum greets Koko reluctantly and Nankipu warmly. Nankipu confesses his love to Yum Yum, and when the two are alone, reveals his true identity as the son of the Mikado, the emperor. Nankipu has been on the run, disguised of all things, as a second trombonist because while at the imperial court, he had inadvertently captivated the heart of Kadisha. Uh, and Kadisha is uh, perhaps best described as she appears in, in this original rendition as a superannuated but sexually voracious lady of the court. Nankipu has been ordered to marry Kadisha or face death for flirting. Uh, Nankipu and Yum Yum at this point, flirting all the while, bemoan the laws against flirting to each other. At this point, Koko receives a letter from the Mikado threatening to abolish his newly attained position of Lord High Executioner and demote Tidipu from town to village unless someone is executed within a month. Koko, uh, Puba, and Pishtush uh, consult among themselves as to who might be the best candidate, during which Koko is reminded that he is, after all, already first in line for execution. Nankipu walks in on these uh, deliberations with a rope, preparing to hang himself out of romantic despair. Nankipu then tells Koko that, provided he can marry Yum Yum the next day, he'll let Koko execute him within a month's time. After some jealous, jealous anguish, but anxious to, have, to save his own neck, Koko congratulates Nankipu on his pledge. Their merriment, though, is interrupted by Katisha's entrance. Katisha tries to reveal Nankipu's identity as the son of the Mikado, but the others on stage sing a Japanese-sounding yet meaningless song uh, by the title of O ni bikuri shakuri to, which um, doesn't mean anything <laughs> as far as I've been able to discern, but they, they sing this in order to drown out her revelation. At this point, Katisha exits vowing revenge, and so uh, Act 1 ends, and we begin with Act 2. And Act 2, as Act 1, opens in Koko's garden, where Yum Yum, her sisters, and the ladies chorus prepare for her wedding. Yum Yum sings an aria celebrating her own beauty in anticipation of her impending marriage with Nankipu. Her happiness, though, is cut short when she's reminded that her married life 
is destined to end in a month's time with Nankipu's execution. Nankipu enters, trying to cheer them up with a song. Koko then enters and informs them of a newfound problem with their agreement. It has come to his attention that under the Mikado's law, when a married man is beheaded, his wife must be buried alive. Such are the laws of the land. Needless to say, this development dampens Yum Yum's uh, enthusiasm for matrimony. <laughs> Nankipu then says he'll kill himself immediately, and the problem here for Coco is it leaves Coco right where he started. In other words, with the renewed necessity for beheading himself. Okay. Um, at this point, learning that the Mikado, and here is a representation, these are, these are little cards that were sold during the time when the opera was first performed, advertising players, cigarettes, but they feature all the, all the uh, characters of that time. So learning that the Mikado and his entourage are approaching the, the town of Tidipu, Nankipu offers himself up for immediate execution. But Koko finds he doesn't actually have it in him to carry out his duties as Lord High Executioner. He then discovers that perhaps simply by producing an affidavit attesting to the executions having been carried out, he may be able to get out of his bind. Providing Koko will let him marry Yum Yum anyway, Nankipu agrees to his plan. Puba is bribed into standing witness in the capacity of every official position he has usurped, and then in his capacity as Archbishop of all things, he marries the couple off stage. The chorus enters, followed by the Mikado himself and Katisha, and the Mikado discourses at this point on his so-called humane notions of governance, which are based upon finding appropriate punishments for various offenses. When he is falsely told that an execution has been carried out, he asks for the gory details. Koko, Pity Singh, and Puba oblige him, lying through their teeth all the while. However, the Mikado surprises them by saying that he is not in Tunipu after all to affirm the execution, but to find his son, Nankipu. Katisha then discovers Nankipu's name on the execution affidavit, and the Mikado officious, officially, officiously, I should say, schedules painful deaths for Koko, Pity Singh, and Pubaz having lied to him. Something humorous but lingering, with either boiling oil or melted lead, he muses. This spectacle is scheduled to take place after lunch. The unfortunate trio bemoan their fate, and after the Mikado and Katisha leave, they decide Nankipu must be produced if they are to avoid their parboiled fate. Uh, Nankipu and Yum Yum enter, but Nankipu tells them that since he has just married Yum Yum, he cannot reveal himself to his father for fear of risking beheading for himself and live burial for Yum Yum. So, Nankipu proposes that Koko marry Katisha to mitigate this risk, and Koko reluctantly agrees. Katisha Believing that Nankipu has actually been killed, sings of her loss. Koko, whom she detests, tries to woo, -hoo, woo her to ensure his own survival. Eventually, he wins her over with a song about, of all things, the suicide of a lovelorn bird. Um, this, this song warms uh, Katisha's heart, and uh, they celebrate their impending wedding with a song extolling the union of sexual passion with ugliness. When the Mikado returns from lunch, Katisha asks his mercy for the three culprits. Nankipu and Yum Yum then appear, and Koko explains the deception in a way that actually satisfies the Mikado. All of them then join together in a final song and dance, and the opera ends. Well, uh, you can see that this is kind of a, a strange story. <laughs> and, um, I think you can also see that uh, more than the utter absurdity of the characters' names, 
the overview I've just related reveals many casual presumptions made about the nature of Japan and its people. Ruled by the, the casually sadistic Mikado, theirs is a despotic, punishment-driven culture. Laws are not only arbitrary and punished with violent relish, they are evidently based on the personal caprice of those in high places. Yet such is the state of officialdom's corruption that even the emperor can be easily deceived into believing a decree has been carried out by an affidavit that attests to as much. Flattery and bribes are how things get accomplished, family lineage is one's road to power and wealth, and because the laws they so rigorously reinforce, reinforce are so absurd to begin with, these people in their ways cannot but be represented as ridiculous. That over the many decades during which the Mikado has, uh, has, has been performed, the locus for such absurdity has remained unchanged. It hasn't really changed at all. It's uh, always, almost in every instance that I've been able to come across, it has been set in this strange Japan. And I would say that this fact has everything to do with the nature of the gaze that the West has for centuries directed at Japan. Uh, in case you're wondering where this is, it doesn't exist. Um, I was looking for an image of the Orient uh, just online, and I found uh, all kinds of images for so-called Oriental wallpaper that you can put on your screen. So, so this is going to be my representation of the Orient in a general sense. Um, from the time of ancient Greece down to the present, the idea of the Orient has exercised a peculiar hold on the Western imagination. The more distant a country is from one's own homeland, the greater the tendency to map one's own fears, fantasies, and desires onto the realm of that geography, to imagine the people who live there as exotic, even beyond comprehension. The fact that Japan had closed itself off to contact with most Westerners for much of the Edo period, this was a period that ran from 1603 to 1868, served only to heighten the sense of exoticism it held in the Western imagination. Fearing Christian missionaries preaching the shogun's authority as subordinate to that of God, in the 1630s, the shogunate decreed that Japan's borders would henceforth be closed to international trade, except with non-proselytizing peoples, such as those of China and Holland. Ships from these countries were allowed to dock only at designated ports, such as the artificial island of Deshima, which was built literally just feet off the coast of Nagasaki. Deshima is the tiny settlement, which is actually, you can't really see it here, but it's built in the Dutch style that uh, it's at the bottom of this painting on the screen right now. In the ensuing decades, Ships from various Western nations would try to get Japan to open its ports for trade without success. In the meantime, very little information about Japan left the country. This information came mostly from Dutch sailors. As Europeans, they embodied the ideals of the West as well as a way of looking at the world that was colored by those ideals. In contrast to those people who they deemed Oriental, they regarded themselves as dynamic and materialistic, as practical, hardworking, and logical. Because Japan was so very far from the center of such conceits, it was assumed to possess a culture whose values were at odds, often diametrically so, with those of Europeans. In fact, Europeans of the 16th through 19th centuries regarded the people of all such so-called oriental civilizations as despotic and barbarous, their cultures as stagnant. But consider how such conclusions were reached. In uh, 1585, long before uh, Japan had actually closed its borders to most foreigners, the Jesuit Louis Foy depicted Japan in contrast to his own Spanish culture making a list of stark differences between the two, and, and this is an excerpt of the things that he observed. The women in Europe do not go out of the house without their husband's permission. 
Japanese women are free to go wherever they please without the husband knowing about it. With us, it is not very common that the women can write. The noble ladies of Japan consider it a humiliation not to be able to write. In Europe, the men are tailors, and in Japan, the women. That's already a strike against Koko right there. Um, our children first learn to read and then to write. Japanese children first begin to write and thereafter to read. We believe in future glory or punishment and in the immortality of the soul. The Zen monks deny all that and vow that there is nothing more than birth and death. Our churches are high and narrow. The Japanese temples are broad and low. People in Europe love baked and boiled fish. The Japanese much prefer it raw. We fight on horseback. The Japanese dismount when they go into battle. We mount a horse with the left foot first. The Japanese mount with the right foot first. In Europe, the streets are low in the middle, so the water can flow off of them. In Japan, they're high in the middle and low by the houses, so that, if it, so that it flows off alongside the houses. This sense of Japan as literally backwards, a kind of photo negative, would be propagated in subsequent Western observations of Japan. Here is uh, what Sir Rutherford Alcock, the first British diplomat to live in Japan, had to say around the year 1880. Japan is essentially a country of paradoxes and anomalies where all, even familiar things, put on new faces and are curiously reversed. Except that they do not walk on their heads instead of their feet, there are few things in which they do not seem by some occult law to have been impelled in a perfectly opposite direction in a reverse order. They write from top to bottom, right to left, in perpendicular instead of horizontal lines, and their books begin where ours end, thus furnishing good examples of the curious perfection this rule of contraries has attained. Their locks, though imitated from Europe, are all made to lock by turning the key from left to right. Their day is for the most part our night, and this principle of antagonisms crops up in the most unexpected and bizarre ways in all their moral being, customs, and habits. There, old men fly kites while the children look on. The carpenter uses his plane by drawing it to him, and the tailors stitch from them. And finally, the utter confusion of sexes in the public bathhouse making that correct, which we in the West deem so shocking and improper, I leave as I find it a problem to solve. So I went on at length with these descriptions because there's something striking that they both share. Uh, what they share is the fact that each describes only the actions of individuals, like the mounting of a horse or the stitching of cloth. But from the observation of such discrete actions, profound conclusions are drawn. Traits appropriate only to individuals are used to draw conclusions about an entire society, accruing over time into an essentializing discursive construct that goes by the name Japan. Take this excerpt from an article on Japan written in 1979 by an American correspondent living in Tokyo. Any outside observer may find more than a touch of the unreal in the reality that is Japan. What at first appears to be a straightforward, what at what it first appears to be straightforward, at a second glance quickly takes on aspects of the absurd. So obviously, no peacefully functioning society is absurd, at least not to its own members. But that is what each of these descriptions that were made hundreds of years apart from one another connotes about Japan. So the question is, why is such a stilted sense of Japan persisting among Western observers? The answer has everything to do with the fact that at the time each report was, um, at the time each report was written, the writer wrote from a position of unquestioned cultural dominance. At the time he wrote about Japan, each writer's respective country occupied a position of military superiority relative to the Japanese. In the 16th century, the Spanish were sailing all over the globe. They had their fingers in markets everywhere and were proselytizing non-Westerners worldwide with Christian doctrine. 
By the late 19th century, when Sir Rutherford Alcock made his observations, the British Empire spanned so much of the Earth's surface, it was said that the sun never set upon it. And in the late 20th century, America dominated the free world with its massive fleets and nuclear arsenal. In other words, at the times that each statement was written, their authors' respective nations had immense power vis-a-vis -vis Japan. Each such description of Japan uncritically augmented the ones preceding it so that the portrait of Japan that thereby took shape gradually took on the aura of truth in the minds of Westerners. In other words, as Edward Said asserts in his 1979 book, Orientalism, those non-Western societies deemed Oriental came to be regarded as such because they could be submitted to be made Oriental. As Said writes, the scholar, the missionary, the trader, or the soldier was in those places deemed Oriental because he could be there with very little resistance on the Orient's part. This isn't to say that Western writers were somehow lying in their observations that, for example, Japanese warriors really did not mount their horses from the right. Instead, it's to say that implicit in the writer's observations is the sense that in their enumeration of myriad small markers of difference lay the basis for profound inferences to be drawn, inferences with moral implications. The Western observers, secure in their military predominance, presumed that their power stemmed in part from God's favor and was therefore proof of their own moral rectitude. The conclusion they drew was that anyone who evinced opposite traits, no matter how insignificant, was therefore morally suspect. This is why Sir Rutherford Alcock could look upon mixed sex bathing in Japan as a problem to be solved. Indeed, Japan opened up uh, in 1853 by threat of main force by the US Navy, um, and it found itself under those conditions with very little wherewithal to resist much of anything in regard to judgment-laden observations made by Westerners. That Japan was compelled to trade and interact with the West on the West's terms added to the, to the, uh, to the exoticizing gaze Westerners tended to turn on Japan. Westerners were fascinated by this land that had been virtually sealed off to outside eyes for over 200 years. People snapped up woodblock prints, Japanese fabrics, samples of calligraphy to frame. And if you look carefully, there's even a little pornography in there on one of those panels. That's a shunga, which means a spring picture, which is uh, sort of a euphemism for that genre. Um, and, um, and, and international expositions, which of course were all the rage in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, featuring exhibits of exotic peoples and lands pervade Japan as a kind of exotic never-never land. In fact, so enticing was this discursively constructed Japan to Westerners that Japanese art began to exert a profound effect on the Western artists of the day. The impressionistic paintings of Monet, the poetry of Baudelaire revealed this influence. Van Gogh imitated the style of the Japanese painter Hiroshige, embellishing the borders of his 1887 uh, flowering plum tree with largely unintelligible squiggles supposed to represent Chinese characters. In the foyer of his house, the eminent French novelist Emile Zola even hung up erotic Japanese prints. When we pause to consider whether he would have likely hung up erotic French prints in the same place, we realize that he viewed the two sorts of erotica through very different eyes. Japan's status as an oriental nation precluded its erotica from appearing as anything other than a curiosity to Western observers. It was precisely this kind of sensibility that fueled representations of Japanese like we see in Gilbert and Sullivan's Mikado. A verse from the chorus's opening song of the opera goes like this. If you want to know who we are, we are gentlemen of Japan. On many a vase and jar, on many a screen and fan, we figure in lively paint. Our attitudes queer and quaint, 
you're wrong because you think it ain't. So, uh, queer and quaint describe how Japan of this period appeared to Westerners. Visitors to, to Japan tended to see what they had been predisposed by such representations to find. They regarded Japan as some sort of ideally innocent land, like the Garden of Eden before the Apa. One traveler wrote, in Japan, one lives in full daylight. Modesty, or rather immodesty, is not known. It is the innocence of the early paradise, and the costumes of our first parents have nothing which shock the sentiments of these people who still live in a golden age. The overwhelmingly male visitors who went to Japan found what was for them a kind of dreamland at this juncture, where they could let their fantasies run wild. Women were always made available to them at the ports of call, and the rationalization for their steady supply was the Western conceit that Buddhism in no way contradicted erotic love. Such conceits, though, were founded on the notion that the West was moral and the East, being opposite, was therefore somehow immoral, a place where anything went. Accordingly, many adventurers set sail for Japan and took up, at least for a while, with Japanese women. This was the climate that induced Puccini to write the opera Madame Butterfly about an American naval officer who, already married back home, marries a Japanese woman only to desert her. The equation of Japanese women with sexual availability has proven remarkably tenacious, as evoked in the 1964 James Bond movie, You Only Live Twice. And uh, so you might wonder at this point, well, it seems that the image of Japan as constructed by the Western gaze that I've just presented here is a sort of feminine appearing place. And so we have to ask, how were Japanese men regarded by this Western gaze? One American woman traveling Japan during the late 19th century described them as, quote, dishonest, tricky, and altogether unreliable, unquote. In fact, Japanese men were broadly regarded as utterly lacking in business savvy, owing to the supposition that they simply didn't seem to desire much. One British newspaper put it this way, Wealthy, we do not at all think Japan will become. The advantages conferred by nature, with the exception of climate and the love of indolence and pleasure of the people themselves, forbid it. The Japanese are a happy race, and being content with little, are not likely to achieve much. Uh, yes. But even as such assessments were being made, Japanese bristled under the yoke of unequal treaties imposed upon them by Western powers and the conditions that enabled whatever the West chose to say about Japan to be uncritically accepted by Westerners as truthful. Knowing they could not overturn such misapprehensions through military force, Japan decided to learn from the West. The purpose was to prove, in the only way the West seemed able to understand, that Japanese were equally deserving of respect. Should this come about, they reasoned, the Western powers would remove the quasi-colonial conditions they had imposed upon Japan. And accordingly, the Japanese began to court the West on its own terms. In 1883, the Japanese government built the Rokumeikan, or the Deer, Deer Cry Pavilion, as it's known, which was a great hall built in the Victorian style in Tokyo. This hall boasted everything calculated to appeal to the sensibilities of Western diplomats and businessmen, including a ballroom and a billiards hall. Unfortunately, this expensive undertaking made little progress in changing Western attitudes toward the Japanese. As one Western observer wrote, at the dance, there were innumerable Japanese gentlemen. These ministers, admirals, officers, and officials are a little too overbedecked in gold braid, all dressed up for the ball. And how strangely they wear their swallowtails. No doubt their backs are not made to wear this sort of thing. Impossible to say for what reason, but I find them always in some indescribable way very similar to monkeys. There was a cruel irony 
to how Japanese and Western dress appeared absurd to Western eyes. For not only had dress styles started to become Western by this point, Japanese industry, medicine, education, politics, all were modernizing along Western lines. In their self-conscious attempts to modernize, Japanese leaders extensively researched what was best in the West so they might adopt only those aspects, thereby gaining the West's strengths and avoiding its weaknesses. Page. As Japan modernized, it seemed, um, every Westerner writing about the place began to point out to what they felt were sharp contrasts be between the so-called Western and the so-called Eastern elements that they found there. Its urban skylines, now punctuated by factory chimneys, Western visitors were shocked when they failed to find the expected unspoiled oriental land as they regarded it. They registered their resentment at such progress by proffering that Western elements they saw amounted merely to skin-deep caricatures of Western advancement. They would go on to assert that underneath this purported veneer, the Japanese himself was what they called an untrustworthy Oriental. The more Japan strove to reach a level of technological equality with the West, changing its quaint uh, castle towns into industrial behemoths, the more fervently Westerners sought to cling to their image of Japan as an exotic, ethereal land. And perhaps this is one reason why Japan's victory over China in the Sino-Japanese War of 1894 to 95 came as such a shock to the West. And Japan's victory over Russia in the Russo-Japanese War of 1904-05 made many Westerners' blood run cold, for this was the first time a, a so-called non-white nation had ever defeated a so-called white nation. Rather than dispel the West's Orientalist attitude toward Japan, rather than compel the Western powers to regard Japan as an equal deserving of respect, Japan's victories merely changed the content of Westerners' Orientalist assessments. Now, they argued, Japan would throw off its thin veneer of westernization, resort to a supposed Mongolian past, and lead the Chinese against the western powers in an all-out war of Orientals versus Occidentals. No less exotic in the eyes of westerners for having vanquished the Russians, Japanese found themselves transformed by the western gaze into a deadly menace all the more deadly because essentially unknown. Accordingly, a new image was drawn of Japan as a site of the yellow peril. Western novelists, influenced by Japan's victories, began churning out stories with titles like The Yellow Invasion. Just like the calligraphy samples and woodblock prints before them, such works contributed to a discourse constructing Japanese as not only exotic, but also as rapacious and inscrutable. Unsurprisingly, the apprehension of Japanese as inherently rapacious and inscrutable rose to the fore during World War II. This wartime propaganda poster features a caricatured image of a Japanese soldier. It was just such equations of phenotypic characteristics with character that brought about the forced displacement of American citizens of Japanese descent to internment camps during the war. As the fighting in the Pacific went on, however, Japanese were increasingly represented as animals. As the island hopping campaigns made their hard fought and bloody way across the Pacific, Japanese were depicted as animals further and further down the food chain, eventually acquiring the status of bugs to be exterminated like so many pests. With Allied victory, the animalistic depictions softened, but they were no less demeaning. Such dehumanization of the enemy had served to make the genocidal incendiary bombing raids on Japanese cities that much more palatable to Americans. Under such conditions, the decision to drop nuclear weapons on primarily civilian populations at a time 
when Japan's ability to continue waging offensive war had already been decimated, may have been made all that much easier to decide upon. And then decades after the war, and once Japan had rebuilt its post-war economy and hit its stride, distorted representations of Japan still continued. Now, instead of a rapacious monster, Japanese were depicted as economic animals. By the 1970s, Japanese were increasingly regarded by Westerners as inhuman in their all-out pursuit of GNP growth above all other concerns, in their polluting and destroying the beauty of the archipelago through burgeoning industry and building massive housing complexes. Even by the 1980s, by which point Japan had become a full Fledged, a full-fledged player in international trade, the caricatures continued. Uh, this, this, is a, this is a cover of a German magazine, Der Spiegel, and um, it's uh, from the 1980s, and it's concerned with um, the trade imbalance between Japan and other auto-producing nations, and it's saying that Europe is coming under the wheels of Japan, and you can see the obvious caricatures there. They're, possible to ignore. Um, and so what I'm trying to say by sort of historicizing this tendency is um, that although the content of such exoticizing representations of Japan has changed markedly over the years since Japan first opened to the West, the logic at work is the same. Whenever there has been a wave of fear or dislike of Japan and the Japanese, as has happened in times of war or recession or trade fiction, Westerners will readily invoke negative images inherited from a previous generation, like those of cruel soldiers, violent suicides, and ruthlessly unfair competitors. Relatively neutral descriptors of Japanese cultural proclivities thereby assume negative connotations. And so a term like uh, consensual decision-making becomes conformism. Disciplined becomes regimented. Willingness to learn becomes slavish imitation, etc. In these kinds of ways, Orientalism makes its way unconsciously into our everyday habits of thought and speech. And the result, as you might imagine, of this kind of thinking is to create a sense that those whose race or ethnicity is different from one's own are different because they possess some kind of core, some core traits common to everyone who looks like they do. The insidious nature of this misapprehension is that such a core is assumed to override the eminently individual differences in personality, in personal circumstances, and the dynamism of historical change. That we Americans have lived through so many white and black police killings over the course of our history precisely exemplifies the places to which this kind of essentialized thinking leads. Horrible deaths, such as those of Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and so many, many others has made eminently clear the necessity for organizations such as Black Lives Matter to, eradic to eradicate white supremacy, which depends for its power on the propagation of that notion of some kind of core said to preclude racial equality. White supremacist attitudes towards Asians have persisted for more than 150 years in the US. With the passage at various times in our history, We've seen uh, all kinds of anti-Asian immigration legislation passed, um, with the incarceration of American citizens of Japanese ethnicity in American internment camps during World War II, and more recently, by the association of Asians with the spread of COVID. When former President Trump referred to the virus as the Chinese virus and the Kung flu, Far from merely making jokes in poor taste, he was tapping into centuries of racial sedimentation, even as he added a new layer. In the aftermath of such statements, a white gunman killed eight women, six of whom were Asian. Over the period March 2020 to February 2021, 
the nonprofit coalition Stop AAPI Hate logged 3,795 reports of anti-Asian hate incidents. This was an increase of almost 150% over the figure for the previous year of 2019. Such incidents included people being slashed across the face with box cutters, burned by thrown chemicals, punched in the face, and thrown to the ground. And so, within such a fraught context as this, it seems unconscionable to stage the Mikado as traditionally performed. Yet when we think of the many human witnesses, I'm sorry, the many human weaknesses satirized in the Mikado, the corruption that so often accompanies power, greed, arrogance, guile, narcissism, sanctimoniousness, self-satisfaction, casual sadism, we realize that actually these are universal human traits that have been demonstrated throughout human history regardless of race and ethnicity. For that reason, as well as the Mikado's long-standing popularity around the world, perhaps we can consider that there is something worth salvaging in this highly problematic opera. Perhaps salvaging it and improving it by resetting it in a locale much closer to theater goers' homes and repopulating it with characters whose predilections are immediately recognizable in ourselves and in our neighbors, both in terms of how we live out our contemporary lifestyle choices and espouse the values that go with them. One of the unintended effects of Bozeman's ever accelerating rate of change, growth, and prominence uh, it's, it's now, of course, become a so-called destination, is that such displays, which uh, strike me as alternately irritating, tiresome, and bemusing, have become increasingly hard to ignore. So I don't want to provide any spoilers here. Uh, uh, I'll let you do that if you want to show a clip <laughs> later. But, um, but I'll, I'll just conclude by saying that Soren Kisiel's Montana Mikado deftly turns the lampooning spotlight away from two white Victorian era artists' fantasy of an, Ori of an Oriental Never Never Land, training it instead with wicked insightfulness on those eminently human foibles so often displayed by those of us for whom Bozeman is our home, our workplace, and our playground. And in my opinion, his timing for doing so couldn't be better. So thank you very much.